Okay, this video is for my Year 12 students. I'm uh, going to start teaching you about the PIC16F uh, 84A microcontroller and assembly programming very soon. And uh, I thought I would share this with you. It's a document that I've created. Uh, it's currently just as a draft. Um, no doubt there are still a few minor errors in it. Um, and almost certainly I'm going to be updating it. However, I thought that it would be useful if I make a video talk you through the contents of this because um, there's an awful lot of information in here and you're likely to want to refer back to it. As I say, I'm going to share this with you. So I will um, email you a link and uh, so you can go back to the uh, revised copy anytime that you want. So um, first thing I'd like to point out that um, there is lots of useful stuff in here and you could have possibly found some of it by reading the data sheet and some other documents yourself as well. It's very easy for me to say that though, um, well not really very easy but I can say it, um, but I'm well aware that um, the, uh, the date sheet is um, very large and uh, your first impressions are going to be that it's a little bit overwhelming. So I think it helps if I point some stuff out but you know, as you develop your knowledge you want to keep on going back to it again and again and you'll find you can gl glean lots more information more than, I've, uh, than I'm going to mention now. Let's have a look at the second slide then. Uh, so this is the layout of the uh, microcontroller that we're going to use. Um, there's a couple of different varieties of it. We are going to use um, a, a through-hole package, a PDIP plastic dual inline package. Um, you will see in the data sheet some references to other um, outlines as well. Um, the small outline IC is one of them. Um, now, do not get confused because in the data sheet, they're dealing with different package types and um, they have different capabilities. So one that we use is a PIC16F84A04. So um, whenever you're looking through the data sheet, just make sure that you're looking at the right thing. Uh, so this is the, um, I've just picked out the picture just for this one and not the um, small outline I see. Um, as you can see, it's an 18 pin package, uh, pin one indicated with the dot there, and we've also got the cutout there, standard on the stuff we've used so far. Um, now the PIC 16F84A has something that, that are called ports, and there's two lots of ports. Ports are just groups of pins, groups of input and output pins, and they get called port A and port B. So if you have a look through all these uh, pins here, in this uh, diagram here, you'll see, for example, RA1 and RA0, they belong to port A, RB7, RB6, these ones, these belong to port B. Uh, so it's got two ports. Um, these ports are tri-state. That one threw me initially when I started to learn about microcontrollers. Tri-state pins um, can output low, in other words, like zero volts or close to it, output high. And then also they can uh, be used as a high impedance input. Um, so there's three different states to them. So basically as an output, you can output a high or low, and then also you can use them as an input. Um, and hopefully you remember that why we might want an input to be high impedance so it doesn't load the uh, circuit that's providing the signal. So let's just have a look through some of these pins. I've noted down some important points. You'll see pin four is the uh, master clear. Um, and as I've noted up here, um, the horizontal bar above uh, indicates it is an active low reset. That's going to be important. Um, so if, for example, you um, ignored that and you didn't uh, connect this to anything, so you left it floating, um, the chip might just keep on resetting itself because remember, it's going to reset when it's low. OK, so we've also got this pin, pin 5. This is known as VSS. They don't call it zero volts, they call it VSS. Um, that is, though, what we're going to connect uh, to our ground rail, zero volts. Um, it might be worthwhile just remembering that S comes from MOSFETs, source, if you remember source gate and drain. OK, on the right hand side, I'm pointing out that pins 15 and 16, they connect to a clock. So the thing which is going to determine the rate at which this is running, um, that's going to connect up to 15 and 16. VDD is the positive power supply. Remember I said about drain and source and gate. Um, so uh, on lots of chips like these, you won't actually see like plus and V and zero volts. You'll see 
VSS and VDD. That's most of the things that we need to cover that. Okay, let's have a look at the next sheet. There's loads of stuff here. I realize this. These ones here are the absolute maximum ratings. All of this, you, need, you can't skip it, but let's just uh, point out some particularly important stuff here. The maximum output current uh, that can be sunk by any I.O. pin, maximum output current source by any I.O. pin. Um, OK, so let's just quickly review uh, syncing and sourcing. Uh, when you sync current into an output, uh, the current is going to flow into that pin. It's going to enter the pin. And when you source it, that's like the traditional view for most students, I think, where the, the output um, has a current coming out. That the source, when you source from a pin, it's going to come out from that output pin and go through down to ground. So you'll notice that the output currents uh, by any I.O. pin are limited to 25 milliamps. Uh, that's going to be um, quite important. Uh, I frequently find students ignore that and then say maybe they're going to drive uh, like an array of LEDs or something like that. And put the LEDs in parallel and maybe each LED is pulling 20 milliamps or whatever it happens to be. So don't do that. Um, <clears throat> the maximum current sunk by port A, the total of port A is 80 milliamps. So if you've got multiple um, pins being used in port A or port B, you've got to total up the currents and make sure that in total, the aggregate total is not greater than the maximum current that can be sunk by that port. So you've got individual pin limits. and You've also got um, port limits. Let's skip through some of that now. Uh, I just want to point this thing out here. OK, this seems a little bit random, but I've um, included the prices that we uh, often pay for our uh, PIC 16F84As. So I guess we'd probably buy 25 at a time or more. Um, £2.61. Now, if you exceed the power supply voltages, we had a student last year who circuit didn't work, so just kept on turning the voltage up. Just thought, well, maybe it will start working. But obviously, it didn't. Um, don't do that. Um, they're not throwaway prices. Um, and uh, also, if you um, apply like here voltage on VDD with respect to VSS. So, for example, if you reverse bias it, so uh, you put VDD like minus 4.5 volts uh, because you've put the battery around the wrong way, say um, potentially you, well, you've exceeded the absolute maximum rating. So, um, yeah, you might damage your chip. Now, the chip might not just go up in smoke, probably won't. Um, you might not notice anything wrong with it, but it might perform. Um, unexpectedly later so you really don't want to do that. It'd be a good idea to consider adding a diode uh, but don't forget that you can have the forward voltage drop of the diode so silicon diode 0.7 volts so for example if you have like a four and a half volt battery and you've got silicon diode of 0.7 volts drop <clears throat> then you've only got 3.8 volts left. That really is significant. I need to um, impress on you that, that diode drop is going to be significant later when we look at um, clock speeds. OK, let's look at the next slide. Um, I thought this was quite useful from the data sheet. Uh, it indicates uh, for test conditions of a four and a half volt supply um, what an output low actually means. So um, the, if, say, you have a pin configured as an output and you output uh, a a low, a logic low, false, off, whatever you want to say. Um, it might be zero volts, um, but at most it should not be any greater than 0 0.6 volts. That's that's the low. Um, the output high, on the other hand, let's say if you've got like a five volt battery, you can't expect uh, when you um, make an output high, you can't expect that same voltage out. So what this is suggesting here, then you should get at least whatever the supply voltage is, less 0 0.7 volts. So say, for example, if you've got a 5 volt battery, then you might expect um, at least 4.3 out when, excuse me, when um, you've got a logic high. That's for all ports now, including these special ones. OK. Uh, moving on then, let's have a look at this stuff. Um, yeah, so 
Um, the PIC16 F84A is a reduced instruction set microcontroller. Um, there's only 35 single uh, word instructions to learn. We'll, we'll come to those later and you don't even need to learn all of those, not for the A-level. Um, this thing though really causes people lots of issues. Uh, I had lots of people last year who were suggesting to me that they thought they could get their microcontroller to run at 20 megahertz, and fair enough, it does say that, doesn't it? However, you won't be able to do that. Um, we don't use um, the microcontroller, the version that will actually run at that speed. If you have a look, if you remember, let's just go back a moment. I said we used a PIC 16F 84A04. Let's go back to the slide. The PIC 16F 84A04. We can get it to run at 4 megahertz. Now, importantly, we can get it to run at 4 megahertz if we have a supply voltage between 4 volts and 5.5 volts. So, like I was saying earlier, if you have um, 3A batteries, say, and they are maybe 1.5 volts, maybe they're not, maybe they're 1.2 volts each, and then you have a diode as well, which is going to drop 0.7 volts, you're going to be less than uh, 4 volts, you may not get the 4 megahertz frequency. I'm not saying you won't, but you may not, because you're not working within the manufacturer's parameters. So let's pick 16F 84A. So where do they get this 20 megahertz? Well, if you have a look over here, um, look, there's some different figures here. Look, pick 16LF 84A04. Okay, so um, I presume that's the low voltage one, although I don't know that's a fact. Um, so yeah, you can get 10 megahertz, you can get 4 megahertz down to 2 volts, but we don't use that one, okay? So ignore that one. This is one we use. Uh, you will not get 20 megahertz. Um, okay, so this bit, this ran a bit. I said this last sentence is very useful. Let's read it in RC mode, which is capacitor mode. This is the oscillator, the, the timing thing. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this pin outputs the clock out, which has one quarter of the frequency of OSC1. Now this is the last, this is the main thing that I wanted to get across. It denotes the instruction cycle rate. So for example, if you've got um, an RC network that gives you a frequency input clock frequency of four megahertz, that's then going to be quartered. So four megahertz divided by four, one quarter of it is going to be one megahertz. So that's the instruction cycle rate. So one megahertz, one million clock cycles a second. Okay, let's um, carry on reading. Um, yep, so why might adding the reverse bias, uh, reverse bias uh, protection diode be a problem? Well, hopefully you understand now that you might find that you have dropped too much voltage and you're not within this four volts to 5.5 volts range. Um, okay, looking through this, um, table one one, actually very, very useful. Uh, don't forget that this is for the PIC16F84A pinout description. There might be another table in the data sheet for the other form factors. So um, some inputs have Schmidt triggers. If you look through it, each one of these is telling you which pin we're talking about. Remember RB1, RB0, these are um, port B, so these are port A, so you can see that we've got five, port, five pins in port L, five inputs or outputs in port. A and then um, 8 from 0 to 7 in port B and you'll see that some of these if you have a look at buffer type you'll see some of these have um, Schmidt triggers. The reason why I'm um, raising this is because last year I had um, some students talking about um, adding Schmidt triggers um, you know as, as a discrete thing um, to um, tidy up um, input onto some pins and I was I pointed out to them that this microcontroller actually has Schmidt triggers for um, for the very purpose that they were after so yeah you do need to check if you want a Schmidt trigger um, input then there probably is one available here let's have a look through so master clear yeah we know that um, okay I'm just looking through TTL logic, you need to Google TTL logic to find out about that. Um, 
RB0 has a particularly important function, this thing here, it can be selected as an external interrupt pin. You need to learn about that in the ex uh, for the exam and also for your coursework, but you know, we'll come to that later. Uh, this thing is what we mentioned on the previous slide, that the instruction cycle rate is the frequency of the oscillator divided by 4. Um, if you ever decide to use RA4, and I would avoid it unless you have to, you have to understand it's an open drain output. So let's, so I copy these ones from the internet just to hopefully explain. Um, okay, so it looks like it's got a MOSFET there. So this is like, you know, if this were the microcontroller, and you can, hopefully you can see that we're actually going to sync current into the output. And so when the output goes high, then no current will flow because there will be no potential difference or a, a too, too small a potential difference between here and, and, the, and the pin. Um, and when the output goes low, so traditionally you'd think, well, low, it will go off. But actually, no, then you've got potential difference. So then you could actually have current sunk in there. Um, one thing to really stress, because I've seen students do it now, is that you must have a current limiting resistor or must have some sort of uh, resistive load here. Because when you think about it, uh, you've just got a MOSFET here and you've got gate. Um, drain and source. If you don't have any resistance of uh, current, then basically, and let's say if you just tie this to the um, power rail, you just have a straight, virtually a straight short. It's just going to be limited by um, RDS on of the MOSFET. Not a good thing. Um, yeah, I point this out. Um, port B, does it say it here somewhere? Yeah. Um, Port B can be software program for internal weak pull up on all inputs. So you might just want to bear in mind that um, like if you would insist in the control last year, you probably remember um, that we can't have floating inputs. So you normally use a pull up or a pull down resistor. Um, you don't actually with um, the PIC 16 f 84 a uh, you've got the option if you want to enable an internal weak pull up. Um, so instead of having an, like a, an external physical resistor, you can uh, enable it in software instead. So, yeah, if you want to, you can do that. Um, this table, what have I said? Uh, useful information about logic level thresholds. So, what have we got? Yeah, okay. So, this is for inputs, isn't it? Uh, yeah, input low voltage. So, what is regarded as an input low? So uh, it depends on which type of port you're using. Let's just say it's an IO port and not a Smith trigger port. An IO port would regard anything between VSS to zero volts in our case, and 0.8 volts to be low, assuming that your supply voltage was between 4.5 and 5.5 volts. Uh, slightly different for Smith triggers. Um, and then the high, logic high, will be if it's a TTL input, will be between two volts and the supply voltage. So for example, if you gave it 1.9 volts, um, that would be somewhere in between low, logic low and logic high. So you wouldn't want that. If you want to make sure it's a low, so you could give it 0.5 volts, that would be regarded as low because it's, it's between VSS and 0.8. If you want a logic high and say you gave it three volts that would be regarded as high because it's between two volts and VDD, the supply voltage. Okay, no doubt there's some more stuff in there, but I'll just skip on, otherwise this video will go on forever. Oh, loads of stuff here. Um, types of oscillators, yeah, we've got different things we could do. Um, uh, as a school, we tend not to use these crystal oscillators. I've, I've got some at home. Um, if you use a crystal oscillator, then you uh, use a couple of capacitors there. Um, we tend at school, because they're just convenient to use a ceramic resonator, we've got some 4 megahertz ceramic resonator. And remember, if you have 4 megahertz, then it's going to be divided by 4, so it'd be 1 megahertz. So instruction cycle um, is going to be um, 1 million times a second, which is actually quite convenient when you do some calculations later. 
Um, so if you use this package, it's basically the um, it's like a crystal with the capacitors in there. Um, when you use Circuit Wizard, there isn't this component, which is really annoying, but we'll come to that. In fact, I don't think there's a crystal in there either. Um, might be worthwhile reading through this. I have copied it for good reasons. I thought it was useful. Um, these links as well, I recommend them for having a look. Um, one point I wanted to make is that they, I think somewhere I possibly read about it. Oh, there, there we go. RC Oscillator offers additional savings during purchase, but you know, don't don't choose an RC oscillator just because, which is a resistor and capacitor, just because you think it's going to save money. Because look, we're only paying twenty p for the um, ceramic resonators anyway, so I'm really not bothered. Just just ceramic resonators if you find it convenient. If you're using Circuit Wizard, as I say, uh, it's got a limited choice of components. So one thing it's also missing is ceramic resonator. So um, if you do a circuit diagram in um, circuit wizard and you'll what you want a ceramic resonator i just went for this um three pin single in line connector instead um if you don't have a ceramic resonator or a crystal or you just want to be really cheap skate and i've done it before and it works perfectly fine i just use a resistor and capacitor um, and then there's a table somewhere it's probably coming up soon uh, showing you about how to calculate what frequency that's going to give you anyway might be some useful stuff there Oh, um, more stuff about using a resistor and capacitor as the oscillator. Um, yeah, okay, so it's giving you some recommended values that you might use there. Um, yeah, so follow their recommendations. Uh, if you're wondering why I put that there, I think it's just cheapskate, really, just using the resistor and capacitor, but if you want to, you can do. Um, okay. You can read that if you want. I don't think there's anything super important. If you still set your heart on using a resistor and capacitor, maybe you're doing it at home, you don't have the part. Um, here's some charts from the data sheet to work out what frequency. But bearing in mind, um, there's quite wide tolerance on the parts. You're not going to get exact frequencies. But anyway, um, so let's have a quick look. Uh, OK, frequency oscillator is going to in this graph is going to depend on the uh, supply voltage. And they're saying here that if you have a capacitor of 22 picofarads and you keep the temperature constant 25 degrees, these are the different frequencies that you're going to experience according to uh, what your resistor is. OK, so hopefully you can interpret that. I'm not going to go through in detail. That's with a 100 picofarad uh, capacitor. That's 300 picofarad. It's not going to give you a precise frequency. Okay, it will not. But you know, um, it's, you're probably not going to do something time sensitive anyway. Okay, um, if you remember, that's slide 11, we'll go back to that in a moment. Um, if you remember Master Clear, so you need to do something about Master Clear because if you don't, nothing's going to work. So, um, if you don't, this is showing a possible way to have a reset switch. If you don't want to have a reset switch, just make that bold here. If you don't want to have a reset switch, um, you could just pull the reset pin straight up to the supply voltage. Nothing wrong with that. Um, however, if you do that, and even if you don't want to have a reset switch, maybe you want to just chuck in a resistor for like less than a penny between pin 4 and the um, supply rail. The reason doing that is maybe later on you fancy just adding a jumper wire or something so you during testing so you can just pull that pin down to ground, down to ground, and um, if you don't have the resistor then that might not be so convenient. It's it's not too big a issue really. Um, if you want to use the reset pin, um, then you probably want to debounce it. So here's here's a possible circuit. We've I think we've gone through something similar before. Okay, these are all the instructions that are available. Not all the ones that you need to learn about. We're going to go through all this in detail. Okay, so. I don't really uh, want to do it now. Um, it's in the data sheet. Um, these, um, this is just like a summary table 
um, if you find this in the data sheet, can't remember what page it's on, find it in data sheet, like the next couple of pages, I think afterwards, it gives you much, much more detail about each command. However, you still want to read some of this stuff. Um, I can't remember where. Maybe it's not there, but there is some very useful stuff elsewhere uh, on this page. Um, OK, so um, a couple of years ago, most students were removing their um, PIC16F84 aid chips from the circuit each time they wanted to program them using a, a programmer that was uh, attached to a computer, then removing the chip from the programmer and pins were getting bent up and it was causing them a problem. And then so uh, what I did it last year was introduce a PIC kit 3, uh, which is an in-circuit serial programmer. And so what that gave everyone was the ability to uh, leave the chip in the circuit board that they were making and then program it in circuit, yeah, in place. Uh, it's considerably more convenient, a, a lot better. You're not having to yank the uh, chip in and out all the time. Uh, it's just wholly better. Everything about it is better. OK, so um, I strongly recommend, pretty much insist, that you give it a go, OK? Uh, that you're going to include a, an ICSP header in your circuit. It's so easy to do as well, okay? This page gives you loads of information about it. Um, on the data sheet, I think, which we looked at earlier, there was somewhere RP6 and RP7 hidden in here. I, I initially, when I first got picked, I found this a little bit buried. did find it in the end, though, that um, these two pins are actually the serial programming clock and the serial programming data. Um, and then so programming clock, PGC, and programming data, PGD. That's what those are referring to. So um, for example, I think this drawing is terrible here, but um, pin one of the PIC kit should then go to master clear. Pin two of the PIC kit, by the way, that arrow, the triangle there is referring to pin one, and then so then pin two of the pick kit will be going to the power supply, etc. So that's the way it gets wired up. Um, I think there are actually six pins on the pick kit. Um, I think the last pin, pin six, is for low voltage programming, which we don't use. Let's carry on down. We're almost well, we're getting close to it. Um, yeah. Um, you can, if you want, you can breadboard it, uh, breadboard your circuits. Um, it would be very nice, though, if you could come up with a PCB. Um, I mean, really nice. Um, also, uh, we've got various competitions and things uh, regionally that you could enter your projects for if you, say, make a more permanent version and possibly make a case as well. So I encourage it. It's a good skin anyway. So. But just as an example, I made a, I oh, didn't make it, I designed a circuit in Circuit Wizard for this, just to show you that it's pos probably possible. Um, I haven't tested it, okay? And don't copy it and claim it's your own. I don't mind you copying it, like to use it to test something, but don't copy it and then try and submit it as your coursework, because, um, yeah, you won't get away with it. Um, there is no PIC16F84A in Circuit Wizard, so what I do, I just um, drag in a, a DIP package, an 18-pin DIP package. So that means you can't do any simulations in Circuit Wizard. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there's no ceramic resonator, so I just use a 3-pin single inline connector. Um, the only reason why I used that with switch was because I wanted to use a uh, slide switch there, and that one converted automatically into that. I've included a diode there, uh, and you'll probably notice I've got a 6 volt, which normally we don't use, but of course 6 volts with a diode drop of 0 0.7 volts, that will give me 5.3, and the timings we looked at earlier was for 4.5 to 5.5, if I remember correctly. So that would be my reasoning. Um, I'm just looking through now. Um, can't remember what the pinouts are on these, so we'd have to we'd have to check. Okay, but anyway, um, yeah, a couple of these pins, I believe they're probably the program data and program data and the clock. Um, in fact, they are. Let's see that. Why do you think I put LEDs on them? Well, 
to me, I find it quite useful that whilst the bit kit's programming the chip, I can actually see a little bit of flashing. I mean, the flashing, I can't interpret, but I can see there's activity on those lines. I find it quite useful. As I say, I haven't built this circuit, but I've built lots of other bit kit circuits or PIC 16F84A circuits, which have used um, PIC uh, kit uh, headers. So I have some experience of it and this one might not be absolutely right. I haven't double checked it, did this quickly, but maybe you can, if you can see an error, point it out, uh, we can always update it. Um, equally, I haven't made this one uh, and this one's unfinished. I just started off just to show you roughly what the layout of um, strip board could possibly be. Not definitely, but possibly. Um, so if you look, uh, okay, so the power from the battery go through a diode. So then this rail here, the lower of these two here, that's my positive supply. Um, and then that's my ground. So then I extend my ground there and take my ground there as well. So that's my ground. This is a um, uh, header connector for LEDs. So, um, yep. And then all these are the resistors for the LEDs. I'm using three of the outputs there, uh, which is RB1, RB2, RB3. Haven't used RB0 uh, because that's the external interrupts. I might use that for something else. And then if I wanted, say, to use RB5 and RB4, I could take some wires around from here. And anyway, it's just like showing you a possible sort of setup. Um, this would be for the uh, pit kit. Um, yeah, as uh, oh, another good thing to note is that I've added, um, then this would be like one of the first things I would do. So along with the pin header um, and then the diode, I've then got a resistor and a power on LED just to show me when the when the power is on, when the power is connected. It's really useful because then if later on you accidentally short out the connections uh, somewhere on the board, then your power on LED won't light. Um, yeah, so that's really incredibly useful. Uh, moving on. Oh, we're almost there now. Look, if you want more information, just Google search PIC16F84A. Uh, should come up with a link on the microchip website, and this is the data sheet you should find. Uh, do look at the table of contents. That's the way I navigate around. Um, we're going to be using uh, MPLAB X IDE. Um, once again, you can just Google it. Um, the current link, last time I looked, was there. Um, if you're using Windows, I've also used it on Linux, perfectly fine, it's good. Um, and if you're using Windows, though, um, yeah, that was the link that I found at that time. Oh, that's it. Okay, so um, yeah, basically. That's a run through of some stuff that I found that was useful. It's uh, not entirely comprehensive. Uh, it may include the occasional errors. Uh, if it includes anything significant, I'll either completely update it, maybe scrap this video, or add a comment and hopefully people will read. Um, but yeah, I will make this available to you. So you can use this as a resource um, and then you can refer back to it. And I really want you to be using this to then um, guide you and um, encourage you to read the data sheet because it's a data sheet which is a reference. What I'm saying is just my interpretation of some things. Okay. So anyway, that's, that's it. I'll stop things there.